You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Good Question Podcast. Today, I'm going to talk about the book called Outsmart Your Brain, written by Dan Willingham. He's the author. That's a new book that's come out. Daniel is a uh, Virginia professor with a PhD in cognitive psychology. He, his degree came from Harvard. And we're going to talk about how he's realized that the way students learn could be done in a better way. And some tips and tricks for people that want to think better and more clearly and perform better and probably a host of other benefits. So, Dan, thanks for coming. Happy to be here. If you would, tell me about your history. What what got you interested in how students study and how people think and take in information? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, I'm a little bit unusual in the way I came to this work. I trained as a cognitive psychologist whose work was sort of at the intersection of experimental psychology and neuroscience. So I was interested in the idea that there are different systems in the brain that handle different sorts of learning tasks. And I was not interested at all in student learning beyond sort of trying to teach my own class as well. And about 10 or 12 years post PhD, so I was already a, had been a professor at the University of Virginia for a while, I was asked to give a talk to a bunch of teachers. And I told the person who invited me, you know, I don't know anything about classes really. I'm a, I, you know, I study learning, but like not like that, not in a way that would really help anybody. And he said, no, we get that, but we just think the teachers might find it interesting. So, you know, I've got an ego like anybody else. I was kind of flattered to be asked. So I said, okay, sure, I'll, get, I'll give this talk. Six months pass, and I suddenly realize in a couple of weeks I have to give this talk, and I absolutely panic because I didn't know what I was going to be able to tell teachers about learning that they didn't already know. So, But I knew it was too late for me to cancel, so I went to the materials I used to teach Introduction to Cognitive Psychology to undergraduates at UVA, which is sort of the first course you would take about learning if you came to our college, and I picked out some stuff that I thought maybe teachers would find useful. And I went and gave the talk on that basis. And to my astonishment, teachers, first of all, didn't already know this content. And second, thought it was really interesting and useful for them. And my career completely changed course. I thought, my gosh, if, if most teachers don't know, you know this work from my field, we've done a terrible job of, of communicating it. Though I started writing for teachers and now for students. Well, maybe it's because teachers are told what to teach but not how to teach. I don't know. Is that that's part of the trick? You know, I think they are taught how to teach, but they're taught lots of different ways to think about how to teach. A lot of people have asked me, why is it that teachers don't know this content? And, you know, the answer is bound to be complicated because there are lots of places to for teacher education in this country, and there's a lot of variation. But that's my best guess, is that they're introduced to many different ways of thinking about this, but not always to the latest scientific research in how learning actually happens. So what is the content that you're speaking about? What are some of the examples of things that you're surprised and teachers don't know how to teach? So study strategies is one thing. So one of the strongest findings we know is that testing yourself is actually one of the best ways to cement things into memory. It's much better than studying something a second time. And that's what students tend to do. They tend to read over their notes, read over the textbook again and again and again. And this is actually bad in two different ways. It's bad because memory works best if you probe memory. So if you go into memory and sort of try and find something, that's actually a really effective way to cement something that is in memory, but but kind of frail. Students will test themselves, but only at the very end to see if they're if they have learned the the content sufficiently well that they can stop studying. But that's a, another finding that students don't and students and teachers don't know about, which is how to test whether or not you've really learned something. 
So in the process, I, I just said that what the main way that students study is by rereading. They read over their textbook and their notes again and again. And what that does is it boosts familiarity. The, the, your textbook starts to seem really, really familiar because you've reread it three or four times. And students mistake familiarity for a more robust memory. They think, you know, they're reading through and they're like, yep, yep, this all makes sense. Yep. Oh, I've seen this so many times. I've, I've totally got this. But if you took the book away and asked them, okay, now, you know, describe this content to me that you're supposed to know, they would see they actually don't know it. So students don't use the most effective strategies either for stuff on the way in or for stuff on the way out to see whether or not they've really mastered it. Having been through school and college and everything, I never thought that the teachers were helpful and try to help me learn. It was more of like a punishment, you know? All right, here's what we covered. Here's your homework. If you don't do it, you're in trouble because I'm going to test you on it. And if you don't do this, then, you know, you, you haven't learned. There was no, there was nothing helpful about it. It was always like a negative thing. It, it felt like from the teachers. So I, I guess I don't think that most of them were teaching this, but they're coming from an ad adversarial standpoint, it seems to me at least. So what do you think? I think there's a lot of variation in teaching styles. I mean, we certainly have surveys on why teachers are in the profession. And, you know, they're not in the profession because they, they think they're going to make money. And then suddenly you discover when they get there, oh, my goodness, I was misinformed. They know they're not going to make much money. And indeed, they don't. And so teachers are there mostly because they like kids and they want to make a difference. So that's typically their motivation. Now, how they present to students I think there is variation and some of them, you know, based on my own experience, like yours, Riches, and now, you know, I've got two children in high school. There are sometimes teachers who are a little frazzled and there, it, it feels pretty adversarial. But I, th I agree with you that the, the system is sort of set up in a way that you could think of the main reason to learn is to avoid punishment, punishment of bad grades where you're disappointed in yourself, your parents are disappointed in you. You possibly even have extra work that you're supposed to do. I agree that the way things are set up now, that seems like an unavoidable issue. So what's the sampling of, you know, without going through everything in the book, what's the sampling of some simple techniques that students can employ on their own without the help of a teacher, whether the teacher's good or bad, to help themselves retain more and learn more and enjoy the experience instead of feeling obligated that they have to learn this stuff and get it in their head? Yeah. So I'll mention a few things. I mean, I've already mentioned a study strategy. I've also mentioned a strategy for determining whether or not you know something. Let's talk about one of the main ways that students have to learn, which is to learn by listening. One of the things that the easy mistakes to make, the reason that listening, which seems like such a straightforward process, goes wrong is that we are so used to listening. It makes us think that listening must be relatively passive. And in a conversation of the sort you and I are having now, it kind of is passive. It's not that demanding because when you're having a conversation with someone, I'm just sort of speaking off the cuff. And if I refer to a new topic, I recognize I need to explain it to you and so on. And the demand on you is not that high. The other time that you listen where things are sort of more organized would be at a movie or some sort of a performance where you're, you're expected to sit and listen for 90 minutes. Uh, but that's also not that demanding when you think about it, because whoever wrote the movie had the audience in mind, and they were trying to be sure it wasn't going to be too taxing for them to understand. So when students are sitting in a classroom and listening to a teacher talk, listening to a teacher explain something, it's easy for, to see how they would fall into the mode of thinking this is listening like I listen anywhere else. But the truth is it's really not listening of, of like you would do anywhere else because you're listening for a different purpose. You're not just listening to be entertained or to chat with a friend. You're listening for the purpose of understanding new content that is going to be unfamiliar and it's probably going to be complicated. And furthermore, somewhere along the line, you need to know this. You need to commit it to memory. And what's more, the information is going to be organized quite differently. So when teachers plan a lesson, it's usually planned hierarchically. So they're, you know, the topic of the day is going to be World War II or something, and they're going to be usually between three and seven 
key takeaways that the teacher wants the class to know about World War II? Maybe something about how it started and then how the U.S. mobilized and so on. And then under each of those main points, there are examples and there are stories and so on. So you imagine sort of a tree diagram. That's the way most lesson plans are organized. And if a problem with listening to a tree diagram is that you can't hear that it's organized as a tree diagram, right? You hear it linearly in time, not as a tree diagram. What that ends up meaning is, you know, to take an example of causes of World War II, the teacher may talk for 10, 15 minutes about the causes of World War II and mention three or four things. So those, I'm, I as a listener, I'm supposed to connect those three or four ideas because they're all causes of World War II, but they're separated in time by as much as 10 minutes. And that's what makes listening so challenging and why students frequently don't take very good notes and don't get everything that teachers hope they're going to get out of a lesson. They don't understand what the organization is. So this is one of the things I talk about in the book is you need, as you're sitting and listening, to try to listen for the organization and understand what are these main points, what are the supporting points, so that you can make those connections. Because teachers, of course, think yeah. those connections are enormously important. Well, and I had plenty of bad teachers. And we had a joke in college, teach me, but not understand, no, great, let's move on. Right. You know, so I had teachers that were horrifically boring. I've had ones that are, you know, all over the place, but I've, I've had almost none that said, all right, we just talked about this concept. Who has questions? What do you guys think about this? That kind of thing. There's, it's just one sided. It's like, blah, 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 blah. I lecture, you write notes, or you listen, and that's it. And there's not a lot of back and forth. And again, some people are just boring, or they're just. And Rich, you know, I think, like, I, I, Rich, I think that's a great point. And it, it sort of highlights or, or exacerbates the problem that I was trying to address in this book. The, you know, one problem is that. Students are expected, as they get older and older, to become more and more independent in their learning. You don't expect kindergarten kids to sit and listen for long periods of time. You don't expect them to know how to commit things to memory. You don't expect them to know how to deal with negative emotions like anxiety. But high school kids and college kids, we very much expect them to know how to do these things. But most of them are not taught how to do them. And then, too, as you, this is now relevant to the point you just brought up, as, as, as you get older and older, your instructors more and more expect that it doesn't matter that much how well I teach. They kind of expect their students to be able to make up for it. As you just said, like, oh, if I'm boring, whatever, like, you know, I'm serving it up. It's up to them to, to learn it. They don't learn. That's their fault, not my fault. Uh, that attitude, I do think, becomes much more prevalent as you get to college compared to, you know, an elementary school experience, for example. Well, I mean, if the teacher wants the students to learn, then, you know, that attitude is counterproductive. Hey, if they don't for learn, sure. it's their problem. You know? Oh, for sure. I guess, yeah. I guess also, too, like I've, I've felt, you know, I'm in my late 40s. I've felt my brain become much more fragmented because of the phone. And, you know, it's my fault, of course that I use the phone and social media and all this stuff, which I keep to a minimum, but I still feel fragmented. So in today's environment, how do you change your methods to work with people that, again, they're constantly switching all day long. Maybe they're looking at TikTok, social media, they're inter getting interrupted all the time. Now they're dropped into a class, let's say that's 40 minutes long with a lecture that just goes on and on. It, it would be like a shock to their brains. How do they process that in today's environment? I, I agree with you that there the digital digital platforms that we all use definitely present a problem. Um, there's debate about whether it's really fundamentally changing our ability to focus attention or whether it's affecting our desire to focus attention. In other words, it may be that we can still, you know, we can still focus. It's no problem. I, mean, I, I mentioned movies before. Movies a good example. You know, if you go to a movie that's a good movie, people are sitting and watching the movie. They're not usually, you know, leaving after 20 minutes saying, well, that's the duration of my attention. I can't, I can't pay attention anymore. They can hang in there and do it. But I do think there's a lower tolerance for boredom than there was a generation ago. People are more easily bored. And so I think teachers definitely feel 
pressure to sort of entertain and, and to keep things going with students. This is not just a teacher problem. This is a parent problem. This is really a society problem. If we've got a generation of kids who don't really want to pay attention to anything, it, there needs to be a comprehensive solution, not just a classroom solution. Hmm. So you mentioned like one of the skills is for someone to test themselves. So how do they do that? Do they just try to recall from memory an answer to a certain sample problem or problems or write yes. them out again and try to struggle through them without looking at the answer? And like, what are some of the parameters that makes an effective test of your knowledge versus not effective? Yeah, exactly. So the the probably the most important two things for, for tests that I think are, are vital. One is that when you're testing yourself, it's you're confident that you're testing yourself on the corpus is really comprehensive, that like you're testing yourself on everything and you're not casual about, you know, creating those materials. And that's actually another thing. Common misconception among students is that the only thing that's going to help your memory is, you know, trying to cram things into memory, like that feeling of actively studying sort of counts and nothing else counts. So this is a reason students go online to look for study materials. And I'm always discouraging my students from doing that because for a couple of reasons. One is that I've looked up the materials that are supposed to be for my courses, and a lot of them are just inaccurate. People post you know, questions and old tests and all that that just aren't right. But the other thing is that students don't realize creating your own study materials is itself studying. Asking yourself, what's likely to be on the test? What do I really need to know? What's a good way to describe this phenomenon? Those are terrific for memory. Memory loves meaning and organizing your materials, putting things together and reflecting on what they mean is going to be terrific for memory. So students often think that they're saving time by finding materials on the internet that they can use to study from, but they don't realize creating their own materials is, is really going to help enormously. I mentioned one other study trick that most students don't realize. Students will study until they know a fact, like if they're using flashcards. When they get a, a flashcard right, they'll take it out of the deck. Or sometimes they'll say, well, I have to go, you know, I have to get it right twice or something. And what they're not doing is accounting for forgetting. So if I'm studying Thursday night for a quiz on Friday, the quiz might be 18 hours later. And so forgetting is going to happen during that delay. So if I study just until I know it, I may think I'm going to get 100% because I studied until I knew everything. But there'll be some forgetting, and tomorrow I probably won't get 100%. So do pretty well, but I won't get 100%. What you need to do is you need to study till you know it, and then you need to keep on studying. And it doesn't need to be a whole lot, but if you study sort of an extra 10%, 15%, that's going to help really lock that knowledge in so that you're protected against forgetting. It's a hard thing for students to do because it feels at the time like it's not really helping because you know everything and you're practicing things that you already know. So it feels funny to do it, but it is helpful. But what about the type of learning? What if, you know, would you counsel a student to identify, all right, Am I being tested for memorization of these things? Or is it more that I need to know which equation I should apply based on the situation? Or I'm just learning the concepts behind this thing? Yeah. And not uh, great, necessarily memorization. Like, what's the difference? The difference is, yeah, if you can find out what you're going to be tested on, what you want to do is prepare study materials that correspond to what's going to appear on the test. So suppose you're going to, it's, it's going to be an essay test and all you're told is, well, you know, covered a number of concepts this semester and you're going to have to write two essays in the course of an hour. So there's, these are going to be long essays. You know, they're going to be big themes. So the way to study for something like that is, yes, you still want to have some facts committed to memory, but you're going to have some flexibility in which facts you use, right? You're going to get to pick and choose rather than being tested on specific content. So you definitely want to have some facts committed to memory, but you also need to really be sure that you understand the themes that, uh, that you went over this semester and that you are ready to elaborate on them. And you can write study materials and test yourself on those materials that correspond to big themes. 
If you're in a math class or a science class and you're going to be tested on specific problems, absolutely, you want to give yourself, you know, create practice problems for yourself. Think about what, you know, the extent to which you're going to be asked to elaborate on the answers, uh, explain the answers versus just straightforward, we, excuse me, straightforwardly solve them. But the basic principle is you want to put things into memory the same way you're later going to take them out. So as much information as you can get about the format of the test, that's going to help you because that's what your study material should look like. Okay. Um, do you have different advice for uh, different grades? You know, if someone's at high school versus college or postgraduate work or per subject, are there, you know, is there very different nuance on uh, a math test versus an English test, an essay, et cetera? Yeah, I think it, it def the advice definitely varies by subject and it more or less in the way that I just described that you different subjects place different demands on your memory. And even within a class, like you could have an English class where the instructor is very focused on details and, you know, you need to memorize poems and you, know, you may be asked by why particular line is there and expected to know it has to do place where the poet grew up and so on, or it could be on very broad themes. So I think there's a lot of room, whatever the subject is, there's a lot of room for the instructor to emphasize different things. And you just need to be aware of what they think is important. When it comes to age, this book is really intended for students starting in middle school and moving towards high school. And your memory does not vary that much between middle school and graduate school. You know, the basic central nervous system is changing, of course, but the basic operating principles are not changing that much. So I wouldn't tell someone to do anything radically different between those ages when they're trying to commit things to memory or trying to take notes. What about people getting tutors? Like, you know, when I was in college, I did a degree in chemical engineering. I did decently, but looking back, I wish I was, I, I wouldn't have been shy about getting extra help if I needed getting tutors help and all that. Yeah. I would go to professors sometimes, but they were jerks. They, they wouldn't really help you. They would try to make you uncomfortable instead. Yeah, um, really, you I wish I would have got college <laughs> experience. I'm so sorry. It sounds like we keep okay. returning to this theme about how terrible the year college instructor. I wish, I wish I had been one of the people who taught you and maybe, maybe you would have had one class that would have been fun and interesting. Makes you feel feel better. Um, you know, I realize with with my kids, we've we've homeschooled them, and I realize like um, most people I know, they'll have like one or two teachers they really like, but yeah. most of them they're like, eh. Yeah. So with my kids, I decided, you know, we we would get various tutors and homeschool teachers for them, and I I said to them, "Do you like the teacher? Are they good?" And if they don't, I would replace the teacher. Sure. And I they only have teachers that they liked. And what I noticed is the cool side effect is that the teachers like them more because they like the teachers and they were more uh, invested in them. Yeah. I had a better educational experience because of it, but I'm afraid I think most people, again, they get one really great teacher every couple of years and that's about it. But most of them are just brutal. Yeah. So yeah. how do you make their learning experience better? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a challenge. And sure, you know, if you can get a tutor, you need a tutor and can get a tutor, Tutoring is obviously going to help. Having one-on-one -on -one instruction where, with with someone who's really competent and can tune that, you know, instead of having 30 students in front of them, or in my case, last fall, 450 students in front of me. If you've just got one person, you can, you know, change what you're doing based on how quickly they're learning and so on. Uh, I think the, you know, the issue for many people is affordability. They like the idea of getting a tutor, but they can't, a lot of college students can't, can't afford that. But if you can do it, it's great. Okay. Anecdotes or, you know, cool stories or testimonials from students that you've helped or taught new ways of thinking and studying and all that, where they, they came back to you and they really had a great breakthrough. Anything come to mind? I ha Yeah. I mean, I've had several students come back to me. I mean, what, the, the first one I'm thinking of actually was quite long ago before I even thought about writing the book, a, a student came to me extremely frustrated because he was putting so much time and effort into uh, his studies and he just was not getting good results at all. So I sat with him and, and really it was like one or two sessions and told him fairly straightforward things. I mean, the kinds of things that we've been talking about here. And he, you know, he was in this huge class I'm, I'm describing. And so I didn't have like a personal relationship with him. 
He was one of you know 300 or 400 students. But he came back a year later after he'd been finished my class and was still at UVA and was in other classes to thank me and said it had just made a dramatic difference in both in his grades and in the amount of time that that he needed to to put into his studies. So that, of course, was you know hugely gratifying. So, yeah, I do. I do hear from students periodically. And that's that's probably the, one of the nicest things about teaching. Are there personality or personal or emotional type things that get in the way of your advice to help students? Like, do you notice that some of them want help, but they just can't discipline themselves to do the methods you suggest and they're just, there's stuff blocking them? I think there are, there are a few things that can get in students' ways. One is self-confidence. So students who really doubt whether they should be in college at all, and this is surprising, I know, I mean, like, if someone, you know, graduates from high school and cares enough about their education to apply to college and, and so on. You think that they're, they're, they would feel pretty good about themselves as a student, but that's not always true. And one of the things I try and talk with students about there is that your self-image as a student is really important because it affects your resilience. If you see yourself as a student and think, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person who belongs in college, you know, you just don't have any doubt that you belong there. If you have a setback, like a failed test or something, as everybody does at some point, your interpretation is very different than if you doubt whether you belong in college. If you doubt, doubt you belong in college, a failed test is interpreted as evidence. Well, maybe I really don't belong here. Whereas if you have no doubt that you belong in college, a failed test, you think, well, you know, the professor was a jerk. It was a bad test. Um, or you think, you know, I should have studied hard or something like that. You don't think it reflects on you, you as a student. And so for those students, I try to point out that a lot of things go into our self-image. One of them is sort of messages you may be absorbed from your family early on, whether your family saw the you know, members of our family as like, we are students, we're the type of people who value this. Or whether your family sort of thought, well, there are lots of ways to be successful in life. And some people think school is important and that's fine for them. But, you know, school wasn't very important for me and I did fine and so on. Those sorts of family attitudes kids will absorb and that can affect, end up affecting your self-confidence. Comparisons are also really important. You know, if you are a B student and you're always comparing yourself to your sibling who gets all A's, you may think you're just a terrible student. But if you're comparing yourself to someone who struggles, you're going to think you're doing pretty well. So you need to think carefully about who you're comparing yourself to. I think the best comparison to make really is to yourself. Am I moving forward? Am I making progress? So yeah, self-confidence is something I would point to as an emotional factor that can really either help or hinder students' progress in school. Yeah, I remember you know, I, took, I had to take physics and all that stuff as part of my degree. I remember I thought at one point I wanted to do theoretical physics, but what kind of killed it for me is I was in class with my friend Chris, and he was reading like The Lord of the Rings or something, and he would write stuff down periodically. I said, Chris, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I listen with half in a year, and when something's important, I write it down. And this kid got like a 4.0, you know, A's and everything. And I was on the edge of my seat, like breaking my brain to try to understand this stuff and make sure I got it. He was like literally attention divided, half asleep getting into a problem. And then I, I thought to myself, well, I'm smart, but I don't think I'm this kind of smart. So I, I put it aside. Maybe it was an unfortunate thing, but maybe a funny story for you. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like everybody knows one person like that guy who just seems to, you know, without any effort, understand everything. I think those people exist. I think they're very, very rare though. You know, I think more, more commonly you get students who have a lot of ability and try to be like that. And then they end up not being nearly as good as they could be. It's sort of like elsewhere. I've drawn an analogy to like the guy on a sports team who's got lots of athletic ability, but always goofing off in practice, never really applying himself. And he's good, but he's not going to be the best guy on the team. How do you bake in all these lessons you've learned to your own teaching? You know, like it sounds like, okay, you're a student, so you better figure this out so you can learn better. Yeah. But again, what, what responsibility do or should the teachers have? And like, what have you taken upon yourself to bake into your teaching to make it more effective? 
Yeah, I, th I think there are definitely things that teachers can do. And although the the book is directed to students, the each chapter ends with a little section about what how teachers can apply these lessons. The most obvious is to tell students about these these strategies for you know taking notes and learning from labs and and all the rest of it. But there are other things that teachers can do that are not just telling students what to do, but actually changes to their teaching. So, for example, I mentioned earlier the challenge for students to when they're learning by listening, that the content that you're teaching is going to be have this organization that is not very obvious to students. So one thing that teachers can do is they can make that organization more obvious to students. If you're using PowerPoint, which so many instructors do now if they're doing a lecture, you can present an outline at the beginning of your presentation and give people a preview of what they're going to see, and they'll see the organization in your outline. And then as you're going, you can return to that slide, show the outline again, point out to people where they are, uh, where we are now in the presentation in terms of the outline. And that's really going to help people keep things organized in their head. So there definitely are things that instructors can do and not just totally leave the onus on the student. Do you record your lectures? And if so, do you encourage students to watch them and review them? Or is that just going back to the old saw that you said was no good of just going over the material 50 times and assuming you know it? No, I think going over recordings could be okay, but there are two issues. One is that st some students will audio record lectures and I'm fine if they do. I've also talked with a lot of students about whether or not they actually use those audio recordings, and they mostly don't. The reason is clear. It's sort of like if you think to yourself, oh, there was that one part of the lecture that I didn't really get, you could go back to your audio recording, but it's kind of a pain trying to find it. And if you didn't understand it the first time from the way I talked about it, there's no guarantee you're going to understand it by listening to the exact same presentation a second time. So what students are more likely to do, even if, if they've got the audio recording, is they'll ask a friend or they'll ask me about the content that they missed. And I actually think that that makes a lot of sense. Also mentioned that post-pandemic, University of Virginia and a number of other schools are discouraging professors from recording lectures and making them available because they don't want to sort of offer a hybrid experience where like, well, you can either show up or you can watch the lecture at your leisure some other time. They feel like, you know, we're, we're a college who's offering a live education experience. There's value in being there. And so that's what we're asking you to do unless there's some reason that you can't do it. Well, why not do this for the lectures? But in order to get the code to watch it, you have to be in class. And you get it at the end. The student has to walk up and get this little like scrap of paper or something, you know, or whatever, whatever electronic like, need. If you were really worried about it, I would make you go to the lecture and then I would get the thing from you. Yeah, it's like trying to prevent a car from being stolen. Like you could put a club on an alarm that exactly. yeah, sure that there would be there still would be bad behavior, but I would think it would be way cut down versus, you know, just saying an all or nothing. We want students to come live and so we're not putting it online. We're not recording. Maybe there's a hybrid that would work better. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. This is above my pay grade. Happily for me, I'm not the one making these decisions. No, no problem. But now that you've done the book, what's next for you? Like, how else do you want to help students with their learning? Are there more techniques that didn't make it in there that you're now experimenting with? Or like, what's the next phase for you? Not another book about learning, I don't think. I'm interested in writing a book about thinking. And I think this one will be will not be for students. This will just be for adults, and and I hope will be relevant to you know the workplace and other other places that one thinks that that's what I'm working on now. Okay, very good. Well, what's the best place for people to find out more about you? Sounds like getting the book probably is uh, number one thing. So if you can just recap the name, and is it available right now on Amazon, or is it coming out shortly? Like, what's the status? It is out. Uh, it was published on January 24th. The title is Outsmart Your Brain. And if you look on Amazon and all of the other major online sources, you'll be able to find it. Okay, pretty simple. All right. Well, very good. Well, Dan, thank you so much for you know, your contributions to helping students and everyone to learn better if they choose to do so. And if you work as a teacher and for coming on the podcast too. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. 
Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at the Good Question Podcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit the Good Question Podcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 